that Western sanctions have caused a shortage of technology and chips, which has affected China's economy and people's livelihoods. Of course, the Chinese military equipment will also be affected. This is the topic we are discussing today, or as we like to call it, when the West sneezes, China catches a cold and needs more tissues. The capability gap between the PLA and the U.S. Armed Forces. Let us begin. We discussed the differences in capabilities between the PLA and the U.S. military. It's worth noting that the U.S. has conducted military reconnaissance in the Taiwan Strait for several years, using only reconnaissance planes like the RC-135 without fighter jet escorts. The reason for this is twofold. The PLA strategic fear and the U.S. military's superior capabilities. When the U.S. F-16 takes off from its base in Japan, carrying AIM-120D air-to-air missiles that can be launched from 160 kilometers away, the PLA's fighter pilots have yet to even take off. Instead, they simply watch as the RC-135 observing the situation. The U.S. deployment reveals a gap between the two countries in reconnaissance, early warning, and striking capabilities, all of which are related to computing power, specifically the computing speed of chips. This also explains why the U.S. conducts frequent reconnaissance they know they excel in this area, while the PLA is aware of its own shortcomings and can only watch as the U.S. reconnaissance planes fly by. Another example, the CCP's planes flew into Taiwan airspace, and the Americans didn't even bat an eyelid. Why, you ask? Well, they had the Chinese planes on their GPS and were listening in on their radio calls, so they they knew there wasn't any danger. The Americans only spring into action if they sense any real danger. Like if the Chinese plane suddenly started spelling out Taiwan, here we come, over the radio. Well, it's like when a grow up is playing with a child. The US military's combat capability is several times that of the Chinese military. So it's not even a fair fight. It's like the US is using high tech weapons while China is still using sticks and stones. So, China's military provocation is about as effective as a toddler throwing a temper tantrum. The U.S. just ignores it. The military prowess of the PLA has been reduced to a level of nearly that of a developing country. Of course, this is the position America favors and would like the PLA to remain that way. So how can we chip sanctions help with this problem? The CCP is not keen on using Western chips in their weapons. Why? They don't want to deal with any supply chain disruptions or the hassle of asking nicely for some Western chips. Instead, they have decided to make their own chips. To do this, they take apart, borrow from, and digest Western chip technology to create their own CCP versions. These chips are then used in military equipment like the J-20 fighter jet and KJ-500 AEWNC, airborne early warning aircraft. However, The recent U.S. chip sanctions may be a real problem for the CCP. It's not the best news for the CCP's chip industry and may make it difficult to advance their technological ability. This will inevitably impact China's military industry and capability. The fact is, the highest technological level of chips the CCP can produce now is 7 nanometers. As early as July 2021, China's Semiconductor Manufacturing International Corporation began shipping these chips to Minerva, a Bitcoin mining company in the U.S. However, the yield rate is very low and the reliable supply is not stable. The U.S. is trying to prevent the CCP from making these high-level chips because they are so sensitive. If the CCP keeps developing, they will be making 5 nanometer chips in the near future. That's when they'll be creating supercomputers, quantum computing, and leading-edge military weapons. If the CCP can solve these problems on their own, America will be in big trouble. So basically, the U.S. is trying to keep the technology from the CCP. It looks like China's chip industry is feeling a bit inadequate these days. The U.S. sanctions on chips and chip fabricating equipment are causing a major impact. With China unable to get its hands on advanced equipment, like extreme ultraviolet EUV lithography machines, which are necessary for producing chips smaller than 7 nanometers. Much of the equipment China has to make 7 NM chips, if they break down, cannot be repaired, 
because Western countries won't provide service and spare parts. Now, they're stuck using old deep ultraviolet DUV lithography machines, which can only produce 10 nm chips that aren't as powerful and have lower yields. They can't even design cutting edge 3 nm chips because electronic design automation EDA software is restricted from being exported from the West. It looks like China is facing some serious issues developing the next generation of chips. China is in a bit of a predicament when it comes to chip production. They've got the know-how to make chips ranging from 14 nanometers to 28 nanometers, but their equipment is still stuck in the last century. To make matters worse, American engineers have left working in mainland China, leaving the CCP with not enough high-tech talent. And if that wasn't bad enough, Older equipment is banned from export from Western countries. All this means that the CCP's chip production program is in danger of collapsing. What are the military uses of chips? Low-end devices and weapons really don't need a lot of computing power, but reliability is important. Therefore, 65 nanometers is enough. However, the performance of signal processing chips used in fighter jets and early warning planes have a direct impact on the systems. The U.S. military's fighter jets have generally been upgraded to 14 nanometer and 7 nanometer chips. A powerful chip is enough to significantly improve the performance of various weapons and equipments. The Chinese military's reliance on the Beidou satellite navigation system, missile guidance systems, and onboard equipment for various aircraft and aircraft carriers is like relying on a GPS system with outdated maps and a flip phone from the early 2000s. Without sufficiently advanced chips, their weapon systems will not be accurate enough to be effective. The stealth fighter jet J-20 is equipped with a variety of sensors including radar and EOTS to enhance its detection capabilities. To achieve its required design level of detection, two methods were employed. One was to work on the radar computer algorithm and the other was to use more advanced signal processing chips. Without these chips, J-20's detection ability would not be up to the expected level. Of course, at a lower technical level, the PLA can still maintain a Soviet-style military force for a long time to come. Well, it looks like U.S. chip sanctions won't give China's military a heart attack, but it will make it difficult, but not impossible, to achieve their technological goals. Simply put, the U.S. military will keep moving forward at a rapid pace, while the PLA will be much slower. The gap between their respective military strength will keep growing, and China won't be able to give the U.S. a run for its money. So in a nutshell, the PLA is technologically challenged. CCP's statement, even if the U.S. enforces a blockade, it's not a big deal. At this time, some experts came forward and said, what's so great about the U.S. blockade? Only by being cut off from the outside world can we become self-reliant. Previously, Chinese mathematicians like Hua Luogeng and physicists like Qian Shui Sun even managed to create a hydrogen bomb, didn't they? So let me get this straight. These guys went to study abroad in the West, came back, and joined the CCP. They used connections with HK Elite and the international community's silent approval to smuggle high-tech manufacturing equipment into China. Eventually, it seemed China was innovating at a rapid pace. But let's be real, they did it with Western tools and tech, not China's own research and development. So basically, they've made China great again with a little help from the West. Pay attention, readers. Apparently, China thinks they can make their own chips now that it's the 21st century. And get this, their chip companies and device manufacturers raised over $12 billion in an investment through IPOs in the past year. That's tripled the amount from the previous year. But wait, there's more. China is also investing heavily in chip design architecture and materials. They even want to inject another trillion yuan into the semiconductor industry. Sounds like a lot, right? Well, not if you compare it to Taiwan Semiconductor Manufacturing Company Limited to its annual R&D budget. China's hoping that this sprinkle of magic fairy dust will promote the entire industry. Sorry, China but that dream seems a bit over-optimistic. In the world of chips, 
It's like a party with the U.S., Japan, and the Netherlands being the popular guys controlling everything from the guest list to the music selection. They've been at this game for years and have perfected the moves to show for it. Meanwhile, China is trying to sneak in and gatecrash the party with copying. It is said by many people the CCP are like the ultimate tech thieves. They tried to use devious methods to obtain high-tech equipment and knowledge. But let's be real here. The question is whether or not the CCP can produce any of these high-tech items. It's whether or not the sanctions are have enough retroactive power. China may think they're being sneaky by producing products through illegitimate means, but they're only fooling themselves. Once these products are inspected, their problems will be exposed, leaving even foreign companies whose technology has been stolen in a big mess. In the end, these chips can only be used in domestic market products, both civilian and military. It can be said that China's semiconductor manufacturing industry, which has already invested a substantial amount of money, will soon require even more funds to keep the momentum going. The fact is that the Chinese are not as helpless as Westerners think. Over the past 20 years, they've made so-called technological breakthroughs by relying on knockoffs, stealing, and most importantly, buying from foreigners instead of reverse engineering things themselves. Foreigners don't share their best tech with the CCP. For example, the Germans gave the CCP engine technology and the CCP thought they hit the jackpot. They put it in their latest tanks and surprise, surprise, the engine did not perform and was unreliable. This causes the Chinese engine's lifespan to be short and oil leaks to occur frequently. Just imagine, the CCP gives Putin one of these engines and installed in Russian tanks, and within days, it breaks down and starts leaking oil like a sieve. That's a good joke, isn't what it? What can Chinese make by just keeping to themselves and not seeking outside help? Probably only second-rate weapons. Once China is completely cut off, they won't be able to get their hands on the upstream technology and equipment. And if they can't enter the downstream international market, they'll be stuck making chips in their own little bubble. It's like the Soviet Union and Eastern Germany all over again. Back in the day, the Soviet Union was actually holding its own in the semiconductor electronics industry and at times was even giving the U.S. a run for its money. But as the most militaristic nation in human history, the Soviet Union tried to make sure that the electronics would still work after a nuclear apocalypse. Unfortunately, the Soviet Union couldn't quite crack the miniaturization of electronic tubes but simply spent a lot of money. This led to poor economic growth and a nearly non-existent consumer market. Meanwhile, countries like the US and Japan were riding high on the frivolous demand for video games, flat panel TVs, and other leisure electronic items. The Soviet Union was so busy pursuing scientific research that they ended up falling behind by decades, even resorting to ripping chips out of Nintendo consoles to put in their missiles. Talk about a desperate need for retro tech. Now, Putin's army is giving everyone a daily demonstration of their impressive practical efforts in Ukraine.